gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the Ungala, Ontario's 25th Premier, the Honourable Kathleen Wynne. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for that introduction. It was perfect. I don't need to edit it in any way. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Thank you to all of the organizers for, uh, for arranging this, the co-chairs. Thank you so much once again for, uh, for taking this on. It's great to be here with my colleagues from the legislature and, uh, and Andrea, it's wel welcome. And Premier Notley, welcome to Ontario. It's wonderful to have you here. Rachel and I are not wearing hats, so don't try to make us. <laughs> and I've already been told by David Hurley that I'm like some kind of downtown Toronto poser cowgirl, so, you know, whatever. It is, it's great to be here with all of you. I want to begin by acknowledging that uh, we're on the traditional territory of several Indigenous nations, show respect for the long history and many contributions of indig indigenous people in Ontario and special acknowledgement of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And it is really, it is wonderful to be back at the Pembina Ungala again. And I wanna just echo what Ed said, which is what a difference a year makes. It's amazing what has happened in a year, it's fantastic. Last year was my first ungala, and it's nothing short of amazing to think of what we've been able to do together in the last 12 months, and how really how the world has changed for those who are working to create a healthier, more sustainable planet. Now, I said last year something like, so many of you in this room have been working on this for so very many years, and uh, I think now we can agree that the world has really changed in terms of uh, awareness. There's a new hope that's been created for present and future generations with the Paris Agreement, with a new federal government, one that is not only just interested in talking to the provinces, but is also determined to harness Canada's potential to be a low-carbon leader. And with a new Alberta Premier who's embraced her mandate to tackle emissions. That's a world-changing event. And I, I would say, Premier Notley, that your government is one of the reasons that we may one day look back on 2015 and see it as a moment in which our conversation concerning the environment and climate change and our economy changed fundamentally. A year in which the world embraced and acted on things that Pembina has been saying for years, that a sustainable, low-carbon future is not just an ecological necessity, it's an economic opportunity. In Ontario, we are proud to have been leading this uphill march for some time now. So on this occasion, I just want to take a moment and think about how we got here and where we have to go next. So last summer, just after Ontario hosted the Climate Summit of the Americas, and I just want to do a shout out to Glenn Murray, who really worked hard and made that happen. Glenn, thank you. And that culminated in 22 states and regions signing the first ever Pan American Action Statement on Climate Change. After that, I spoke at a, a Climate Reality Project training workshop hosted by former U.S. Vice President Al Gore, and I told a story about one of his earliest mentions in the New York Times. It was June 23, 1988, and the front page of the Times had a headline that read, Global Warming Has Begun. So that was 1988. It covered a congressional hearing where, with 99% certainty, a NASA scientist outlined the warming trend as real, man-made, and destined to get worse. The Times called the testimony a bombshell, but that actually wasn't news to one senator from Tennessee. Six years earlier, then-Congressman Al Gore had invited the same NASA climatologist to speak before a congressional hearing where he delivered the same message. But in 1982, it didn't land on the front page of any newspapers. No one cared, no one noticed. 
Elsewhere in 1982, a sour gas blowout rocked the community of Lodgepole, Alberta, catalyzing the transformation of citizens into activists, and a few ye short years later, they founded Pembina. And I'm talking about those two events because apparently 1982 was an auspicious year for the start of long uphill battles. And because even though change has been slow, change has come. And that's to my point about how hard you have all been working. If we fast forward to 2006, when the Conservatives took over federally and all of a sudden hope seemed to disappear, but it didn't because Pembina didn't lose hope, and neither did Ontario. In fact, that's actually when Ontario stepped up. Some of the th things Ed was talking about, the Green Belt, the Green Energy Act, massive investments in transit, clean tech research funding and incubators, and most famously, North America's largest greenhouse gas reduction to date, the closing of every single one of Ontario's coal-fired power plants. which we completed in 2014 and in good cowboy and cowgirl fashion outlawed last year. <laughs> the transformation of Ontario is well underway. If you look at the growth and innovation that's happening in our clean tech sector, the TSX now lists more clean tech companies than any other exchange in the world. It's pretty remarkable. <laughs> remarkable. So my job when I became Premier was to take the next steps and I moved as quickly as I could to do that. I reached out across the country and in fact, my first visit, my first trip was to Alberta. In a country like Canada, collaboration and cooperation are essential, which is why Canada's premiers came together over the past several years to craft a Canadian energy strategy. And at last year's UNGALA, we had reason to be hopeful, but still we weren't sure, we didn't take anything for granted. Leading into Paris, Ontario spent the year taking the next steps, leading by example, working across the country, and making our case for low carbon, sustainable prosperity. We announced a hard cap on emissions in the form of the cap and trade program that we'll unveil later this year with the aim of linking California, Quebec, and most recently Manitoba in the largest carbon market on the continent. We hosted the Climate Summit of the Americas, that's right. We set a mid-term greenhouse gas reduction target of 37 percent below 1990 levels by 2030. We increased our investment in modern infrastructure like transit and we announced a green investment fund to help businesses and households become more innovative, efficient and sustainable. And we released a new Ontario climate change strategy that looks at the building and transportation sectors because we know those are our biggest challenges next. And having met Ontario's 2014 targets for 6 percent below 1990 levels and grown our economy in the process, I was able, when I was in Paris, to tell a great story, a persuasive case to the rest of the world that we can and we must do more. We had a lot of good information to take to that meeting. And there's one other thing we had in Paris, and that's the federal partner that gets it. For the first time in a long time, Canada was not only present, but was active on the world stage. We had a unified voice, we pushed at key moments for a more ambitious agreement, and we got it. So I would say that cowboys and cowgirls didn't just do Paris, we rocked Paris. It was awesome. So now, for Canada, for Ontario, for businesses and citizens, and for, si for signatories from around the world, the real work has to continue. Earlier I said that we might one day remember 2015 as the year when the world finally got its act together and decisively confronted climate change and related environmental challenges. And I said might because as we know from decades of breakthroughs and then setbacks, nothing is guaranteed. Only with continued vigilance and widespread advocacy will we be able to make the evidence-based policies needed to move forward and make our world a better place. For the longtime advocates in this room, you know that moments like this are characterized by equal parts enthusiasm and suspicion. You've been disappointed before, so you are guarded, and rightly so. I get that. 
but as the supporters and partners of this organization, we also know just how far we've come in public awareness, and I do believe the public is in a different place. I sincerely believe that. Everything that we have seen tells us that the public is in a different place. Public enthusiasm is higher for this work, and in the willingness that now exists among all of us to do our part to create new forms of prosperity today and to protect our future in the process. And that brings me back to something else I said at the Al Gore workshop in July. I didn't get into politics as an environmentalist or as a business person. I was a social justice activist seeking to make my home a fairer, more prosperous place for everyone. But all these years later, I'm still that activist, but I also have to think like an environmentalist and as a business person, because none of those things can be separated. And if we think they can, if we think we can pull those things apart and do them in isolation or do them sequentially, we are dead wrong. We have to do all of that together. Absolutely. And you all know that. You, the people in this room have made that so clear, whether you're from industry or from ENGO or you're finding a better way forward, you're creating jobs and you are pushing all of us, citizens, governments, business alike. You're pushing us towards a brighter future. You've been doing it for years. Keep up the great work. Thank you, merci, miigwech.